Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel Kaufman. I'm one of the three editors of How to Live a Good Life, which uh, came out not long ago on uh, Vintage, uh, alongside uh, with uh, Massimo Piliucci and with Sky Cleary. Um, this is the third in a, seri a small series of uh, discussions with um, both the editors and uh, some of the um, uh, c contributors to the book. Um, today, um, I'm very, very pleased to be talking with um, Hiram Crespo, who authored the, ch uh, the chapter on Epicurean Epicureanism. Um, Hiram is the author of Tending the Epicurean Garden, which came out on the Humanist Press in 2014. He's a translator of several books, a bilingual blogger at the Autarchist and El Nuevo Dia, and the founder of SocietyofEpicurus.com. He lives in Chicago, has contributed content to many outlets in both Spanish and English, and has a BA in Interdisciplinary Studies from Northeastern Illinois University. Uh, the, uh, my other guest is Massimo Pugliucci, uh, who, not only, um, who not only is a, a co-editor of the book, but is also the K.D. Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York. His books include How to Be a Stoic, Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern Life, which came out on Basic Books in 2017. Nonsense on Stilts, How to Tell Science from Bunk, University of Chicago Press 2010, and a Handbook for New Stoics with Gregory Lopez, um, published on The Experiment 2019. He blogs at MassimoPiliucci.com. Uh, I am a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University. I host a program on bloggingheads.tv called Sophia, um, in which I talk with philosophers on a number of subjects. I also publish an online magazine called The Electric Agora. Um, just so that people will know, let me tell you what's going to be co coming up so that we can then finish the rest of the show without interruption. Um, the next episode is going to be Sunday, May 24th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and we're going to have uh, Anne Cleason, who um, penned the chapter on ethical culture and secular humanism, uh, along with Massimo and Sky will be moderating. Then on June 6th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, I will be moderating and will be joined by uh, Brian Van Norden, uh, who wrote the chapter on Confucianism, and Robin Wang, who wrote the chapter on Taoism. Um, and uh, just before we get started, um, let me just say, um, please bear with me. I am barely technologically competent. And um, I'm going to do my best to uh, manage the questions and stuff uh, that I can. But if I fumble around a little bit, please, uh, please forgive me. Um, so let's get started. Um, why don't I start, uh, start with, uh, with Hiram. Um, tell us a little bit about how you came to uh, Epicureanism as, as as a philosophy of life that you that you found compelling and that you find useful in your life, um, and then maybe also tell us a little bit about what you take the core ideas to be, and then I'll go to Massimo and ask him the same. Hi everyone, um, thank you for for having me here. Um, so um, how I came to it, um, I was a content creator and uh, I was reading books on atheism. Um, I'm, I'm one of the contributors and I'm on the editorial team with uh, the Ateístas de Puerto Rico organization, uh, which is an activist organization that promotes um, atheism or critical thinking skills. Um, and um, I was on the editorial team and I was reading a lot of books. And that's usually how I get ideas to write um, essays and content. And I came across, I kept coming across quotes by Epicurus that it made a lot of sense. And I liked them, um, but it never occurred to me that it was a coherent system and that all the ideas fit together neatly and that people call themselves Epicurean still today and that Thomas Jefferson was Epicurean. So all of that sort of came, became evident to me when I read the book by uh, Christopher Hitchens, compiled a series of essays um, I forget the name, but uh, the portable atheist, portable atheist. The first essay there is a compilation of, of, of Lucretius. And, um, and then also you know, just uh, reading about Lucretius and reading about um, just uh, the, the Epicureanism 
and looking into it, I realized that there are people in recent history that were calling themselves Epicurean. Um, Thomas Jefferson was one of them. And during his time, during the Enlightenment era, there are other thinkers, um, including Lamitri and other in intellectuals of that era, that were calling themselves Epicurean. So I was like, well, this is something that, you know, people, people are identifying with. So the more I looked into it, the more I fell in love with the tradition. Um, that's really how I came to it, is through reading um, new atheism literature. Uh, through, uh, uh, I was reading uh, Richard Dawkins at the time, and I was reading uh, Christopher Hitchens. So that was, that's where I was. But I felt like after reading many of these new atheism authors, I felt like we needed a new layer of conversation. I think that what they did was they cleaned up the floor to, to get rid of old ideas, but we needed a new set of ideas to replace the old ideas. And I was very interested in those questions. So that's part of the reason I think why Epicureanism felt very interesting to me. Um, and uh, what I see as the core ideas is basically um, the ethics is based on pleasure. So um, the Epicureans continued the momentum of the ideas of the Cyrenaic school, uh, which were founded on the idea that pleasure is choice worthy for its own sake and a pain is avoidance worthy for its own sake. So they developed this idea uh, further through discussions and through just conversations with each other and just by looking at nature, looking at children and how they behave and how um, babies and kittens and puppies, they shun pain and they seek pleasure from the time they're born. So but this is seen as an innate uh, nature established uh, faculty rather than just an arbitrary ideal that people came up with. So that was interesting to me also. Um, just the anthropology of Epicureanism has always been very interesting to me. Um, so the pleasure ethics um, are among the core ideas and the other core ideas have to do with friendship, have to do with the atomic theory, the idea that we are made of particles and that we, are, that we exist really as material um, entities and that um, matter is always the point of reference, which is to say nature is always the point of reference in our philosophical investigation. Um, that seems common sense to me. And um, what else? And just the idea of trusting your own faculties is also another core idea of Epicurean philosophy. Thank you very much. Um, Massimo, I'm, I'm going to ask you the same thing. Um, how did you how did you come to uh, Stoicism? Um, um, you know, like Epicureanism, these are probably not going to be uh, philosophies of life that you will be born into. Um, and so 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 it's something that you sort of sort of consciously come into. So how did you how did you come to it? And what do you take to be um, the sort of the core elements? So uh, in my case, it was a midlife crisis, you know, mild variety, uh, nothing, nothing horrible. Uh, but nevertheless, a few things happened during the same year that sort of made me sort of think about, okay, uh, I need some kind of framework uh, to deal with problems and to deal with, uh, you know, day-to-day -day life and, and setbacks. And, um, you know, I grew up Catholic, uh, but I left the church when I was a teenager. And after that, I considered myself a secular humanist, which is, as you just mentioned one of the topics that is coming up soon on the on this series however secular humanism when he actually came to to uh facing a crisis and to trying to figure out what to do or what not to do secular humanism wasn't that that useful uh because it turned out to be you know a list of things that i agree with you know if you read something like the secular humanist manifestos um of which there are several versions it's like you know good ideas sure um uh, let's treat other people well and you know justice and all that sort of stuff right but how is that going to help me today because you know my father's just died and and i can't cope with it that sort of situation so um that's what i started looking around that was also the time that i was switching academically from science to philosophy and so i figured hey uh you're studying philosophy at the graduate level surely there are some resources here that can help and um it became very clear um me, almost immediately that if there was going to be an answer coming up to, from philosophy, this was in the general ballpark of virtue ethics. Uh, because virtue ethics is focused on the individual, is focused on self-improvement, on character, uh, on uh, you know, coping with situations and things like that. And so, of course, when you start studying uh, virtue ethics, the first stop is Aristotle. And, uh, and we've done, in fact, <laughs> uh, an episode here on, on Aristotle. We talked about Aristotle in our first episode of uh, of this series because you wrote the chapter on neo-Aristotelianism. Aristotle is obviously 
very interesting. There were a couple of things that didn't really uh, go well too well with me. One is that I tend I tend to think he's very theoretical. There's really not much of a sort of a practical uh, outline of how to actually do things that a result present presents. And he also uh, was a little bit, you know, his philosophy is a little bit on the on the aristocratic side of things. You know, it, it's yes, it's virtue. You have to cultivate virtue, but you also have to have a bunch of other externals in order to have your life you know, flourishing. And I still remember, I chuckled when I read that one of those externals was having, you know, a little bit of good look is also helpful. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm screwed. That's, that's it. Um, I saw the result. Interestingly, my second uh, stop was in fact Epicureanism. And precisely for the reason that Hiram just said, um, Epicureanism is very popular among secular humanists and atheists for a number of reasons. Uh, and these are good reasons. One is because of the of his uh, he was an atomist, so uh, his uh, basic metaphysics uh, is often taken to be a sort of a prelude to modern science. Uh, of course, Epicurus didn't think of atoms in the way in which we think of them today. But nevertheless, he was you know a materialist. It was it was all about you know stuff bumping into the void. So that goes well with the general the general sort of scientific outlook today. And also, uh, as I mentioned, you know the emphasis on on uh, on friendship and on relationship with people, and uh, Epicurus' take on death, um, particularly the fact that uh, there isn't going to be much to worry about um, in the afterlife because, because there is no afterlife. <laughs> you know, the death is, by definition, the lack of sensations. You know, that, that's it. He famously said, "You know, wherever you are, death is not, and and wherever she is, you are not." So all of those things were very appealing. Um, however, there were also a, a number of things that were not very appealing, uh, particularly the the emphasis on, on pleasure and especially absence of pain, um, I thought it's certainly important, but I, it didn't strike me as, as a, in my mind at least, as uh, sufficient for a sort of overarching philosophy of life. And also because Epicureans tend to avoid pain, especially mental pain, uh, there is a sort of recalcitrance to get involved at a so social and political level um, in, uh, um, except for, you know, close friends and things like that. And that was, again, another one of those things I said, no, that's, that's, that's just not me. Uh, it very well may work for other people, but it's not gonna work for me. So I was kind of there in that sort of situation where I was, I was pretty sure that the answer was gonna come from uh, virtual addicts, but so far I had, I had not had luck. And then I uh, looked at uh, my, my, in my Twitter uh, feed one day and I saw this thing that said, help us celebrate Stoic Week. And I thought, what the hell is Stoic Week? And why would anybody want to celebrate the Stoics? Um, and then gradually I realized, oh, wait a minute, Stoics. So that's Marcus Aurelius. I read, I read him in, in, in college. And, and that's Seneca. Seneca, yeah, I translated him when I was in high school. But I never actually put him together. I never actually thought that there were two, two pra practitioners of the same sort of underlying philosophy of life. So I said, ah, oh, let's take a look. And sure enough, I signed up for Stoic Week, which happens every year, usually in October, late October, early November. And so you read a little bit about the Stoics, you, you're given some practical exercises, that was a good thing, you know, that I immediately could sort of sink my teeth into uh, some kind of practice. And the very first guy that I read, the very first sentences that I read from the, from the uh, assigned readings were by Epictetus. And uh, I never heard of Epictetus up to that point. You, you hardly hear about Epictetus even if you take graduate level uh, courses in philosophy, including in ancient philosophy. Even though Epictetus was a very famous philosopher all the way through the 19th century, he's kind of, you know, been gone into eclipse in the beginning of the 20th century. And so I never heard of him. And this guy struck me as exactly right. I mean, one of the first things I read by, by him uh, was the, the beginning of the discourses. And it said, um, so we have to die and, and you know we'll have to think about how to deal with that but it doesn't appear like we're dying today so at the same time i am hungry so let's go out and, and have lunch and deal with death later and i thought okay this guy has a sense of humor obviously he, he, he he's not afraid of talking about you know the big issues death he does that a lot as it as it turns out but he's also no nonsense it's like okay this is a problem but it's not a problem right now so let's talk about things that are actually more you know, more immediate. Um, and sure enough, I uh, committed to study Stoicism for initially for that week and then for a couple of months and then for a year. And now here we are six years later, I'm still talking about it. Now you asked about the basic precepts. Um, so the basic idea, 
Well, Stoic is a Stoicism is a eudaimonic philosophy, so it's in the same general ballpark as Aristotelianism, uh, Epicureanism, Cyrenaism, uh, and academic skepticism, and a bunch of others. Uh, so the goal is to figure out how to live a good life, a life worth living. Right? And according to the Stoics, a life worth living is a life lived according to nature by which they uh, meant human nature, taking seriously human nature. The two fundamental aspects of human nature according to Stoicism are the fact that we are capable of reason, which doesn't mean we're reasonable all the time or even most of the time, but we are capable of it, and that we are highly social. And so they took that as an as a ax axiomatic, and they derived this notion that therefore a good human life, a, a human life worth living, um, is one in which you use your reasoning abilities to help society, to help improve things, to make the, the human cosmopolis better. They, they were among the first cosmopolitans uh, among the ancient, ancient philosophers. And the way they actually do this in practice, I mean, we, we can talk about it in, over the next few minutes, but is by deploying a couple of different frameworks, one of which is inches on four cardinal virtues that the Stoics use as a sort of a moral compass. Everything that you do, you're supposed to ask yourself whether it accords with practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance, which are the, the four cardinal virtues. Okay, um, so clearly, Massimo, from, from what you said, um, you weren't just looking for sort of good ideas or ideas that sort of made sense to you in terms of how to think about your life, you were looking for an actual specific set of practical disciplines, um, th things that you could, things that you could do, the, the things that were very sort of tangible. Um, let me go back to uh, Hiram. Um, now, famously, there's very, we have very little by way of Epicurean writings, um, um, much less than we have, um, obviously, either of Aristotelian or um, or Stoic uh, writings, um, and so you know, if if there was a lot, if there was a lot more by way of practical disciplines and and uh, uh, techniques in in Epicurus, we just don't know about it. Um, so let me ask you, Hiram. Um, a, were you not looking for something so specific, but just more for sort of like a way to think about your life, um, and um, and if so. I, how does how does Epicureanism, given that it's relatively um, that we have very relatively little of it, how do you wind how does it wind up playing out um, um, in your in your daily life? Epicureanism is practiced as a philosophy of friendship. So the context is just an informal circle of friends talking about philosophical issues. Um, the garden was a very informal, I mean, even the idea of the garden itself, just it's a garden. You know, people are sitting around. Um, it's a very pleasant environment. And it's just friends in conversation. And that, so that's one of the main sources of pleasure for the Epicurean is friendship. So, um, so I, I um, so for instance, when we uh, get together online and we talk about philosophy, we have, uh, we study our books, we discuss philosophy together. The ancient Epicureans, they used to have a celebration on the 20th of the month, every month. So they came up with excuses to come together. Um, the 20th of the month was um, established, the celebration of the 20th was established in the la final testimony of Epicurus um, as a way to remember the Epicureans that came before. So that was just their main excuse. So there would be a feast of reason. They would have um, Mediterranean cuisine and they would um, probably have books or other things that they would discuss and get together. Uh, birthdays were very important. Uh, the 20th was originally a celebration of, of a birthday, of, I think of Metrodorus, is the co-founder. And uh, so that's, that's the practice uh, of Epicurean philosophy, is just uh, being with friends. Epicurus says that when you're going to eat, you should think as much about who you're going to eat with as what you're going to eat. So the idea of just being, you know, just hanging out around the table and having conversations, that is the practice. Um, I think there are many cultures around the world that have wisdom traditions that are somewhat parallel that can give you an idea of what that kind of pleasant lifestyle would be with surrounded by friends. I think the, the Scandinavians, they have their Uga tradition. It's spelled H-Y-G-G-E. So just, uh, it's just about, you know, just the pleasant lifestyle. Um, hanging out with friends, you know, when it's cold outside, lighting candles, watching a movie, being cozy with each other, hot chocolate, little things like that. 
And um, um, the, in South America, there's a tradition that's actually, it's called Sumac Causai, the good life in the Inca language. And uh, the principles of Summa Causa are incorporated into the, um, the constitution of Ecuador and, and I think Bolivia. So, and when you read about what that consists of, you know, just the, the, the idea that people should have a right to have time for leisure and time to love, time to spend time with family and that, and that they should learn and be creative and all these things. That is part of Summa Causa and it's enshrined in the constitutions of these countries. Um, so there are many other wisdom traditions that you can look to to try to imagine what an Epicurean wisdom tradition for our time and our culture would look like. But yeah, basically it revolves around the idea of just hanging out with your friends, studying philosophy, and enjoying the simple pleasures. Yeah, almost like a, almost like a sacra, it almost in a sense sacralizes ordinary life and, and relationships and, and intimacies and stuff um, in, in a way that maybe in, in other religions and traditions, you would sacralize something much more transcendent and much more universal. And here it's more about sacralizing sort of the intimate dimension of life. Is that, is that sort of what appealed to it to you just so Definitely. much? Definitely. Yeah. Friends are sacred. Um, the Epicure. So yeah. the, yeah, I mean, it seems very ordinary, but to us, it's very, you know, we are enough of an audience for each other, Epicurus used to say. So we honor our friends. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you, um, and then I'm going to go back to Massimo, and I think after maybe this round of questions, we'll, we'll, we'll turn to the questions from the audience. Um, and so I'm going to want to ask something specific, but it also has a more general implication. So Massimo did raise the issue, and, and it's something that anybody who studies Epicureanism knows, um, that, that Epicurus, um, while you are correct, sort of emphasizing and, and raising to the fore um, one's intimate relationships and friendships, did recommend um, a kind of a withdrawal from the polis, that is, um, um, of a lack of engagement with, with politics. And given that you obviously are very much engaged with um, um, politics, given the work that you do, um, a, I'm wondering how you feel about that element of Epicurus's philosophy, but more, more generally, this is, I'm also going to ask Massimo, um, in what ways have you, have you, in a sense, um, in a sense, created your own Epicurus, in a sense, brought Epicurus into a frame, maybe leaving out some of the original traditional elements? I don't know that I necessarily have left out some of the traditional elements. Um, so, so in Epicurean philosophy, um, all of your choices and avoidances are subject to hedonic calculus, and that is very individual. So it may be circumstances where avoiding politics is, makes sense, but there may be circumstances. I think that it's really impossible to avoid politics entirely. I don't know that that's natural because we are part of the community, and there, you know, our existence here has political mm -hmm. repercussions. So I think there's a natural measure of engaged life that you have to like, that, that naturally you, you participate in. Um, I don't necessarily believe that an Epicurean has to be apolitical or unengaged. Um, think about Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> I mean, what better example? Um, yeah. He called himself an Epicurean and he, he was very knowledgeable about Epicurean philosophy. There's a letter that he wrote to William Short where he's admonishing him and he's, um, delving into specific teachings of, of Epicurean philosophy regarding moderation, for instance. So he was yeah. very engaged in Epicurean ethics and very in, also he had a compromise with the, he was compromised with the happiness and with the character development of his friend. And that's demonstrated in the letter, which is how we treat each other as Epicurean friends. So he was a serious Epicurean, number one. Um, he also was the mentor of Francis Wright. Frances Wright uh, is a very, very, very interesting person. Uh, she, uh, she was very young uh, when he died, but she spent a, she spent a few years in his company um, and they engaged each other as intellectual equals, just like in the ancient gardens. Uh, it was her and a marquis uh, of Lafayette, um, a guy, I think he was from France. Um, all, of them, all of them three together, they spent a few years at Monticello and they had an intellectual exchange that left a mark in her book, which is the great masterpiece in the English language of Epicurean philosophy, A Few Days in Athens, which actually has to do with the, a, the Stoic and Epicurean like intellectual battle that existed in antiquity. 
So when she wrote that, um, she wrote that book, but she also was extremely engaged in her own life. She was a feminist. She was an anti-abolitionist. She was helping Black people to get emancipated and to come together and, for, and, and gain the skills that they needed in order to, uh, to be able to function in society after slavery. So she was extremely engaged. So I do not believe that um, being, being up here means that you cannot be engaged, but those choices and those avoidances are subjected to your hedonic calculus. So you measure the advantages versus disadvantages, the pains versus the pleasure, and there may be many instances where being engaged is a huge source of pleasure. And so you get engaged. So uh, that's not, that's not that in Epicureanism, we don't have a blank order to not be political. That doesn't exist in Epicurean philosophy. All things are subjected to hedonic calculus. Yeah, yeah, I and I would add, you know, John Stuart Mill is also an Epicurean, um, or at least uh, many, many think he is. Um, um, and he says things in utilitarianism that suggest that he is. And he certainly was engaged in the, uh, in the politics and issues of his day. Um, um, Massimo, back to you, and then I think we should go to the audience um, for questions. Um, I've talked to you a lot about sto your stoicism and stuff, but others may not, uh, not, not be aware. Um, you very consciously do embrace what you are calling a modern stoicism. Maybe you can just talk about one or two of the main things that, that, that belong to the ancient or traditional stoicism that um, you think can be removed without, in a sense, rendering the philosophy no longer stoic? Yeah, that's a good, good question. And uh, I think the major thing, a major thing, there's more than one probably, but a major thing that I think we need to, at this point, as modern stoics to do away with, is the ancient conception of providence. So um, if you read Epictetus, and to some extent Seneca and Marcus Aurelius, but particularly Epictetus, uh, it's in some, uh, he often sounds almost like a Christian. He keeps saying God this and God that, and you know, God uh, has put together these things and so on. Now, he was definitely not a Christian. Um, and you understand that once you, you realize that the Stoics were actually calling God uh, what we call nature. So the, 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 the universal web of cause and effect or whatever rational principles organize nature, that is what they called God. And that would be perfectly acceptable also in a modern scientific perspective. However, we also have evidence, particularly from Diogenes Laertius, that the Stoics actually thought of, uh, they were basically pantheists, that, and they particularly thought that God or the universe was alive and capable of reason, the famous, the famous logos. Um, from that, they derived uh, their concept of providence, and that there's this delightful way in which Epictetus puts it, which, uh, which is interesting. Um, at some point he says, look, um, people don't realize that we are just or the organs of a larger organism, right? So they were bits and pieces of the, cosmo, of the cosmic organism. And if the cosmic organism has to do certain things, certain things need to be done, then it is up to us as the organs to do it. And so he's, he uses the analogy of a foot that steps into the mud. And he says, you know, if the foot, if the foot doesn't realize that is connected to an organism that has to step uh, you know, across the street and, and the street is money and so something has to, to happen there, then he's gonna complain. He's gonna say, oh, come on, I don't wanna get money. Why, you know, why doesn't somebody else get money? It's not fair that the universe is a place where I get money. But if he realizes that he's connected to the body and the body has a reason to cross that particular path, then not only he's gonna do it, he's actually gonna embrace it, right? But what, uh, what Nietzsche later on, much later on, called amor fati, love your fate. So it's not just a question that you're going to endure it. You know, it's, it's unpleasant to step into the mud, so you're going to endure it because you don't have a choice. It's that you're actually going to embrace it. Well, that part has to go as far as I'm concerned. Um, and the reason for that is because I'm not a pantheist. I'm not, I don't believe that, you know, I'm a biologist. I don't believe that the universe is a living organism. In fact, I don't think that in terms of modern science, that makes any sense. Um, uh, you know, any, any coherent sense. At the time, it made perfect sense. Epictetus was, in fact, using essentially what we call the argument from design uh, to argue that, that the universe was intelligent and was, you know, creative. And at the time, that was great, that was great. except that now we got two fellows uh, in between the, the 18th and 19th century named David Hume and Charles Darwin, who basically got rid of the argument from design. And so today is no longer tenable. In fact, when I wrote How to Be a Stoic, I have a chapter on the Stoic God, and I talked to Epictetus about it, and I said, well, you know, I bet, I'm actually going to bet that 
uh, smart guy as you are, if you were born, you know, 18 centuries later, you probably wouldn't go that, wouldn't go there. Now, the question is, if you don't, if you eliminate the notion of a cosmic organism, right? What is the what's the problem in, in terms of providence? Well, the problem with providence then is that you can no longer coherently say that we should embrace our fate. Uh, because there is no general, you know, broader purpose that we're serving by stepping into the mud. We're just stepping into the mud and the story, and it is unpleasant, right? But at the same time, uh, much of Stoic philosophy, I think, in particular, the ethics remains intact because, uh, you know, a fundamental aspect of Stoic philosophy is this notion that everything happens because of cause and effect, and that uh, is essentially a deterministic universe. And when things happen to you, there is no reason, you know, there's no point in complaining about it. Uh, Chrysippus has this, uh, another nice analogy. He says, um, imagine that Chrysippus was the third head of the store, so one of the er very early Stoics. And um, he said, you know, imagine that, that there's this dog that is connected by a, a leash to a cart, and, uh, and the cart all of a sudden starts moving. Uh, well, the dog has only two choices. Uh, he either just goes along with, with the cart and you know, gingerly looks around, takes his time to sort of enjoy the ride, but nevertheless goes where the cart is going, or it starts kicking and screaming and throwing in, in itself on the, on the ground, and he's still gonna go where the cart is going because the leash is there. And the analogy of course is that we are, uh, you know, part of a large universe of cause and effect. When things happen to us, they will happen. And so our choices are simply to accept what happens and deal with it in the best possible way that we can with our limited agency or start screaming bloody hell and complaining about it. But the latter simply makes your life more miserable than it would otherwise be. So why would you do that sort of stuff in the first place? So I think that, that by uh, eliminating the notion of a cosmic living organism, one does lose the, uh, the providential aspect of stoicism, but I think that's a relatively minor loss. Most of the rest of the stuff remains in place. You still have, and in fact, we have one of the, the, the ancient stoics themselves who um, uh, very clearly uh, put forth this, this, uh, uh, this, this choice and, and, and explored the consequences, and that's Marcus Aurelius. There are several bits in, uh, in the meditations where he starts a phrase like, well, it's either gods or atoms. And what he was talking about there is the Epicurean perspective, right? It's either gods, meaning it's either this, this providence, this living organism, mm -hmm. this rational being, etc., or it is atoms. It's, it's the Epicurean perspective, uh, metaphysics. And then every single time, although it's clear from the meditation, from the context of the meditation, that he did accept Stoic metaphysics, but every single time that he starts this thing with these, these gods of Adam, he says, well, so what? You still have to get up in the morning and do the job of a human being. You still have to do things virtuously. You still have to be helpful to other people. You still have to use reason. Uh, so it, in practice, nothing really uh, changes that much, even according to Marcus Aurelius. And if Marcus had no problem with, with this, why should I? Yeah, it's funny. The, um, the whole world is an organism and we're a piece of it. Almost sounds like contem the contemporary sort of Gaia hypothesis. Um, um, uh, and I, yeah. I wonder whether they, um, whether they've, whether they, I don't know if you've ever spoken to any of those folks, but do they, are they picking a little bit up from, from Stoicism too, or are they getting that from somewhere else? I'm sure there's more than one tradition that has that view. Um, um, but it's, uh, it sounded like it a little bit when you said it. The proper, yeah, there, there probably is more than one tradition. Uh, for one thing, even if you don't go back to the Stoics uh, and, uh, and you simply think about Spinoza, for instance, who was influenced by the Stoics, but Spinoza also thought in, in a way that it's essentially pantheistic. And so the, that, the notion of Gaia has been around for a while. It is, it has, you know, people, some people have tried to put it on scientific footing uh, over the last few decades. I, again, as a biologist, I don't think actually that's, uh, that's particularly justifiable. Um, you know, it's, the Earth is a planet, it's not a living organism. Yes, it is characterized by complex cycles, geochemical cycles and biological cycles. But, you know, we know enough about those cycles that we don't, have, we don't need the, to invoke the metaphor of a living organism in order to explain what's going on. Yeah. All right, well, I think that we have about 20 minutes now. So I do think we should go to audience questions. And just so everybody knows, um, I, I appreciate that people posting in the chat, but I, I'm afraid that I am not up to the task of multitasking too many things at once. 
So I'm going to to own, I'm going to go on the basis of the raised hand um, system in the in the in the software, um, and um, I will call on you that way. And when I do so, I will um, I will unmute you so that you can go ahead and ask your question. The one thing I would, two things I would ask. One is to identify clearly to whom you're addressing the question. And secondly, um, uh, to make it a, a question and not a speech um, or something like that. Um, so let me go ahead first <laughs> to Robert. It sounds like Robert you've done these kind Cleary. of things before. Yeah, I have. Um, let me go first to Robert Cleary, whose hands seem to have been up first. Let me unmute Robert. Okay, Robert, you are unmuted. Please go ahead and ask your question. Okay, thank you. This is a question from Massimo. Massimo, in a couple of your books, in the further readings sections, um, I noticed in when you uh, talk about William Irvine's book, you warn about his tendency to veer into Epicureanism. The question <laughs> is, what are the what's the source of that confusion? What do people confuse about Stoicism that, you know, where, where they blur those lines? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So Bill is, um, he, he thinks of himself as a, as a practicing Stoic. Um, but if you read particularly uh, one of his early books on the joy of life, uh, it does have a sort of a more, a little bit of an eclectic uh, sort of philosophy. And it seems to draw uh, partly from Epicureanism, he talks about pleasure and, 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 uh, and so forth, for instance. Um, so there is a couple of ways to look at this. On the one hand, there's nothing wrong with uh, adopting an eclectic philosophy of life. In fact, uh, we have very good examples. Um, uh, Dan, you can probably mute, sorry, uh, Robert, so that uh, we have less background noise, <laughs> sorry. Um, so. There's nothing wrong per se with the notion of an eclectic philosophy of life. In fact, I would argue that almost any philosophy of life in the beginning starts out as eclectic, uh, including Stoicism. Uh, so for instance, you know, Stoicism was established by, was founded by Zeno of Citium in around 300 BCE, but Zeno, we know from Diogenes Laertius, had studied with a number of people, beginning with Cratus, who was a cynic, and then he went to the, to the Platonic Academy, and then he studied with uh, the skeptics. So he actually did, um, and then he picked bits and pieces of things that, in, in his mind, uh, went well together, and and started teaching uh, his own, uh, uh, you know, his own brand of philosophy. However, what happened then later is that a guy named Chrysippus, who I already mentioned, uh, came on board. He was the third head of the store, and he was a student of Zeno, and he was a logician. And Chrysippus said, whoa, hold on a second. There's a bunch of stuff that actually doesn't necessarily go together. It doesn't, doesn't really hold in a coherent fashion. So let's clean up a little bit of things. And so Stoicism got, got a little bit more coherent and uh, less eclectic at that point. But, but even after that, there were disagreements both among Stoics themselves on certain aspects of, of the philosophy. And of course, as we've heard with external um, philosophers, including Epicureans, including academic skeptics, and so on and so forth. So I don't think there is anything particularly, uh, you know, out of out of uh, of measure that uh, Bill is doing. Um, however, when you go eclectic, the more eclectic you go, the more you actually run, I think, into a problem, which is uh, because you pick and choose different bits and pieces. Not only the bits and pieces might not actually go together particularly well, and you may not realize it, but you offer yourself a, ni a nice way to rationalize your way out of problems. Because if you try to stand within, to stay within a more or less coherent system, then you have to justify your own choices within that system. And you have to say, okay, well, I'm doing this, and this is, this, this, does this accord, you know, is in agreement with, with, uh, with the philosophy that I've chosen. But if you have an eclectic approach, then you can pick one day, one aspect, another day, another aspect, and just basically go on and, and make up things as, as you go which kind of defeats the purpose of having a, a framework because the whole point of having a framework is to have a shortcut to what, ma what matters, how to behave, how to act, et cetera, et cetera. That said, let me add immediately because that's, that's the other obvious kind of objection. A framework is, is, just it, is just that, a framework. Uh, none of these philosophies are based on anything like scripture or the Ten Commandments. It's not like 
if I don't do what Epictetus says I should do, then I get excommunicated from the Stoic uh, uh, you know, church. There is no such thing as a Stoic church. There is no Stoic Pope. Um, and therefore, you know, you're, you're free to interpret things more or less in the way that makes sense to you, as just as Hiram was saying in terms of Epicureanism. Right? No, nobody, nobody gets uh, sort of uh, taken out of the, of the game just because you don't do exactly uh, what the ancients say. Incidentally, um, Aram, uh, you know, uh, Ed, um, sorry, Dan pointed out that there is comparatively little uh, from Epicurus that survived. Even the Stoics, the estimate is that between 98 and 99 percent of what they wrote is gone. So, although we have a significant amount of writings, uh, you know, I'm very aware of anybody who says, "Well, the Stoics don't do this, or they never said that." Well, we don't know <laughs> because if you lose more than 90 percent of the literature. You don't know what they didn't say. You do know what they did say if it survived, but that's about it. All right, let me go on to um, uh, the next hand up, which is uh, Sam. I'm going to unmute Sam. And um, hmm, it's not letting me unmute Sam. There it is. You, you did it. Yeah, there it is. Did I do it? OK. Sam, go ahead and ask your question. So, Hi, uh, I have a question for Dr. Pelliucci, and uh, that is, uh, how would you characterize the concept of friendship in Stoicism, which can be regarded uh, oftentimes as uh, self-serving or um, not necessarily based on, you know, uh, emotions as it um, was apparently for Epicurus. Uh, Epicureanism is famous for, you know, being with friends, but uh, how does Stoicism deal with the concept of friendship? Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's that's a great question. Actually, the Stoics, uh, that, that's one of the areas where the Stoics converge with the Epicureans. I mean, I, I know that we, we keep hearing about these big battles between the Stoics and the Epicureans at the time, and which is true. Um, but at the same time, actually, they converged on a lot of on a lot of things, one of which was uh, friendship. In particular, if you read uh, some of the letters that uh, Seneca wrote to his friend Lucilius, he addresses specifically the question of friendship. Um, and friendship is very important for, for the Stoics. Um, you have to be very picky about your friends. Epictetus says, you know, essentially, Epictetus gives you the same advice that your mother probably gave you when you were a kid. That is, be careful what kind of, uh, you know, people you hang around with. Uh, if, you, if you don't pick, you know, good, virtuous people, they're not going to good, be good for your character and, uh, and they're going to sort of drag you down. Um, but once, and Seneca says, once you pick, if, and you have to be careful in order to choose a friend, uh, it has that person has to be a really good person that is you know is going to be good for you and you're going to be good for him. But once you do pick, once you consider somebody a friend, you really should commit to that person, you know, wholeheartedly. Uh, so uh, this notion that the you know so the Stoics don't uh, uh, you know don't exercise emotions is actually also inaccurate. What they're trying to do more accurately is to shift away from what they see as destructive negative emotions such as fear and anger and, and hatred. But they also, by the same token, say that we should positively embrace and cultivate positive emotions such as uh, you know, love, friendship, uh, and a sense of friendship for people, uh, justice, a sense of justice, and even a sense of joy about, about life and, and our place in the universe. So, so friendship is a big deal for, for, for the Stoics. Um, and the only diff, the, Perhaps one difference, I'm not sure about this, but one difference with, between the, the appearance, Iram can, can comment on this, is that um, ultimately, however, you are still supposed to be self-sufficient in terms of emotional resilience. That is, friends are people that are going to help you out, grow, and, and when they're there, they make your life much better. But if a friend goes, either because he dies or because he moves away, you're still going to be okay. And the reason you're still going to be okay is because, of course, these kind of things happen in, in life. People die, people move away, and you're not supposed to, in a sense, to be dependent on, on your friends. You're supposed to be improving, you know, uh, 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 having friendship means that your life is more virtuous, you become a better human being, but if your friend is gone, then that's just a fact of life. And, uh, and there is no... Uh, you know, you just that the only option there is essentially to accept it. Yeah. Okay. Let me. Let, I'm going to ask. I'm going to. I am going to bring Hiram in on this one, if you don't mind, Massimo. Um. Um. But let me. Let no. Me go ahead. Bring him in. Let me bring him in by way of sort of a question. Um. So Hiram. Um. What Massimo is essentially saying is that 
friends, and please, Massimo, if I'm wrong about this, correct me. Friends are preferred indifference for the Stoic, um, um, in that the Stoics, whether the Stoics' life is a good one, a life having been worth living, doesn't require that one have friends. That's how someone can live a life worth living, even in slavery um, or in prison. Um, Hiram, how do you how do you view uh, from your perspective and from the tradition that you've embraced? Do do you view friendship as essential to living a good life? Can one live a good life if one is isolated or if one is imprisoned in solitary confinement or in other other ways? Can one still live a good life? No, not just according to the Epicureans as you understand them, but uh, as as you as you think. Yes, um, I. Um... I don't think that's possible. I think that you do need friends. Um, so, uh, the so Epicureanism says that friendship is one of the essential things that you need um, to be happy. Um, in the letter to Minicius, there are certain categories that Epicurus mentions of things that are natural and necessary, and um, they include um, happiness. They include health. They include they include life, which involves security and safety. Um, and within that, that subheading of happiness, you do need friends. Um, now, the Epicurean method of doing philosophy is called the canon, uh, which is basically your five senses, your pleasure and aversion faculty, and so on. And uh, the, we believe that there's enough checks and balances between, those, so between the faculties that we were given uh, to know with certainty certain things. Um, the modern, that evolved in the modern context into the scientific experimental method. So we um, accept research that is empirical. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, scientific research, and insofar as it's empirical, is, has as much authority to me as Epicurean doctrine itself. And um, in my book, in the, in the original book, and in this one also, that in the chapter that I wrote for How to Live a Good Life, I always go to the research first. And I uh, cite the research and explain it, and then from there I develop Epicurus um, doctrines to demonstrate how they're still relevant. So a lot of the research, research that I've looked at actually has been done here in, in Chicago in the universities in my surrounding area. And uh, one of those has to do with how um, isolation is a health risk on par with obesity and smoking. And you can go online and you can see um, a bunch of different like magazines, Psychology Today, and a bunch of other publications that, that explain that research. Um, there's also research on how happiness is contagious, and the other side of that is that um, depression and sadness and just depression is also contagious. So who you associate with um, has a huge effect. We don't fully understand why, but it has a huge effect on your own moods. Um, so yeah, it's very important that you be self-sufficient. That, that is a virtue in the Epicurean tradition, and uh, there's, a, there's a fragment of Epicurean literature that says that Epicurus was... Uh, legendary in his self-sufficiency. So self-sufficiency is very important. And there, and there are ways in which we mourn our friends after they're gone uh, through pleasant remembrance. Uh, this is what, this is the advice that was passed down in my tradition, that we should remember them uh, for their laughter and the good times that we had with them. So we feel our emotions more strongly. Um, we cry if we lose a friend. There's nothing wrong. We're not scared of our emotions in Epicurean philosophy. We see the emotions as very important sources of insight about nature and about ourselves, um, and we fully feel our emotions. Um, there's nothing, you know, crying and be, being vulnerable is actually um, not a sign necessarily of vulnerability. Yes, you're vulnerable, but you're also strong. It requires a certain courage to be vulnerable in front of another person. So we don't have a problem with, with uh, expressing our emotions. As I understand it, uh, as I understand it uh, stoicism, um, apathy is, is an ideal in, in stoicism. I don't know much about stoicism but in our tradition that's one of the main differences between the two traditions is that we have a very different relation with the emotions um, than stoicism so there's um so that's that's sort of where where we are with that with uh, with our different and yet the, the and yet the Epic, and yet the epicurean um ideal is ataraxia isn't it uh, which yeah. is essentially an undisturbed mind and emotions definitely, strong negative emotions definitely disturb your mind. So how, Certainly. how does that work? Right. Um, so. Well, if you, uh, if you read uh, Philodemus um, left a bunch of scrolls at, um, at the library in Herculaneum, including issues of, of anger and arrogance and other right. uh, diseases of the soul and how to treat them. 
um, and yeah. they are seen as perturbations. Um, right. But you do not, there's, well, so there's the initial, the initial pang of anger that you feel that is natural and it's recognized yeah. as natural in the writings. And he says that, well, that indignation happens and it's natural and even the sage experiences that. So right. but then once you experience that and you understand and you gain the insight, there's a cognitive component to it because maybe that somebody wronged you. Maybe there's a grievance that you need to raise, right? So once you get that data from your emotional faculty, then you decide what to do with that. And that's where you are a philosopher and you decide what to do with that emotion, how to make it productive. Philo Demas actually says that anger can be virtuous. If, you, if it is rational and if it is natural, and it's made productive through maybe channeling that anger into a cause, then it will produce right. more pleasure than pain, and then it becomes perfect, right? right? So right. there's a mode of dealing with negative emotions, but we don't repress them, we use them. Well, let's, let's, let's hold on a second, hold on a second, because <laughs> that's, that's one of the, the problems with, with some treatments of stoicism. Nobody represses emotions. It's impossible to repress emotions. So the question is not repressing emotions. The Stoics don't try to repress emotions. In fact, what you were uh, describing just now sounded a lot to me like Seneca on anger, uh, where he says very clearly, anger is a natural uh, you know, emotional response to certain situations, and there's no point in trying to, regret, to, to repress it. You have to uh, deal with it at a cognitive, uh, cognitive fashion. The way in which the Stoics do, do it is different from what then you went on to describe. That's true. But there's no, there's no attempt at repressing emotions because that's simply not, uh, not possible. And both philosophies actually do embrace the concept of ataraxia, which is tranquility of mind. It's just that they uh, arrive at that outcome differently. Ben, uh, back to my, you. <laughs> as a philosopher, I'm as tempted as I am to to let the battle between go, Stoicism and Epicurean <laughs> go on. We're supposed to be taking questions from the audience. I'm going to go on to uh, Joshua right. Banta, so I'm going to unmute Joshua. Joshua, you're unmuted. Go ahead and uh, take your question, please. Uh, okay, one moment here. I'm going to start my video. Uh, so, so my, uh, hello again, everyone. My question is for both Massimo and for Hiram, although uh, it'll, it'll be through the lens of Stoicism, which I'm more familiar with, which is not saying much. Um, and it, is, it has to do with, um, how, in each tra tradition, how do you um, decide whether or, or how to tackle a problem? So my understanding with Stoicism, like, you know, Marcus Aurelius, for instance, talked about figure out what's in your control and what's not in your control as a starting point for how to tackle the problem. So if it's, you know, if it's your, your health or the weather, those are things that you can't control and so you should just set them aside. Well, I mean, weather, yeah, you can't control the weather, sure. But there are things that you can do in the long term, for instance, to control your health. And, 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 and let's say there was a problem where you're not a, you know, a virtuoso a pianist. Well. I mean, you could bring that under your control by giving up everything and studying constantly for decades on the piano. Uh, so the point is, is that thinking about things in your control versus not in your control as a movable object, it, 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 there's an agency involved there like, to try to bring something under your control even. Um, and you have to make decisions about what to bring under your control. So. Am I thinking about this right in terms of neo-Stoicism and, and how would an Epicurean think about deciding how to tackle a problem like this? Okay. Uh, so Hiram, should I go first? Um, uh, Hiram, yeah, so go ahead. Hiram. Let Hiram go first. Yeah. Uh, so we, uh, we uh, deciding how to tackle a problem, I think what you're talking about in Epicurean terms would be hedonic calculus. So we... Um, so we don't take the, what you can control as the starting point, even though that's very prudent and that sometimes makes a huge difference. But we take pleasure as the starting point. If you read, read the letter to Menesius, particularly in the middle portion of the letter to Menesius is where he explains uh, the process of carrying out your choices and avoidances so that through whatever you do, at the end you will get net pleasure. And he explains that you need to look, and this is subjective, naturally, but you, it's sort of, there's no way around this. You have to sort of get in touch with what, what, is, what are your values? What are you expecting from things? And, uh, 
and measure your advantages versus disadvantages from each choice and each avoidance um, or your pleasures versus your pains. And from that, then you come to an idea of this is where I get the most advantage and that's what I'll do. Um, so the process is hedonic calculus in Epicurean philosophy and, um, and pleasure versus aversion is the guiding principle. You know, the idea of control is not so much of a, of a point of reference for us as it is for the Stoics, but it is there. It's just not so much as, as a point of reference for us. Massimo? Yeah. yeah, so the, the dichotomy, what uh, Joshua was referring to is somet sometimes uh, referred to today uh, by modern Stoics, particularly Bill Irvine actually that we mentioned uh, earlier as the dichotomy of control. I don't like the word control because it's misleading and it does lead to the kind of problems that Joshua was pointing out. It's like, well, but some things I control, like, you know, what do I dress, like how I dress today, other things I don't control, the weather, and then a bunch of everything, almost everything else is somewhere in the middle, I have partial control over it. That's, that's why it's not actually very useful to, to call it dichotomy of control. Uh, some people refer to it as the stoic fork. The Stoic fork comes out of this notion that Epictetus has in the Enchiridion, where he says some things are up to you and other things are not up to you. By up to you and not up to you, what he means is with some things, the bug stops with you. You, are the, you have the last word. So for instance, uh, my opinions and my, my, my considered opinions and endorsed values and things like that, those are mine in the sense, not that they're not in, influenced by other people. Of course, my opinion are influenced by other people, right? I have certain political opinions. I have certain opinions about pizza. You know, with then today we're, on, on Twitter, we were talking about Napolitan versus Roman pizza. I have opinions about that, right? But if I say, which I did for the record, uh, no. I Roman was the pizza, one who asked that. <laughs> right. And if I say, and I'm on the record now, and say, and say no, Roman pizza is definitely better than Napolitan pizza, now, you can't say, you know, well, that's your, that's your opinion, of course. And that is under my control in the sense that it is my opinion. The buck stops with me. If you challenge me and I start saying, well, but, you know, this other guy told me so, or this other guy uh, has this opinion, it doesn't matter. I put it forth as my opinion. That's up to me. That's on me. On the other hand, uh, the kinds of things that the Stoics think, think are not up to us are things like health and wealth and reputation and so on and so forth. Now let's take health, um, which is the classic example. People have a lot of, you know, so sort of usually have trouble understanding how is health not under my control? Well, you can do certain number of things with, about your health, right? You can eat uh, a healthy diet, uh, putting down your cholesterol uh, and avoid diabetes. You can go to the gym regularly and exercise to bring up your Mus muscle tone and your and your aerobic capacity. You can go to the doctor regularly to to practice preventing me uh, you know medicine, and then the damn stupid virus hits you randomly, and you end up in the in the hospital. Meaning that the last word it's not yours. Okay, it's not up to you in that sense. In the, in the sense that of course you can and should. Uh, the Stoics are definitely not quietists. They don't lay back and and you know, have other people or, or events walk all over them, uh, on the contrary. Um, but you have to accept from the get-go that the outcome is not up to you. There are other factors that are independent of your will and independent of your efforts that will still change the outcome. Um, another way to think about it is this, um, for people who may be familiar with sort of vector analysis in physics, I know this is gonna be sounding like it coming out of nowhere, but actually I think it helps. So if you remember from, I don't know, uh, college or sometimes uh, high school and you do you do vector analysis so you, you do like a, a, a body that is moving in, in space and things like that the position of a body in space can be a diagram in a Cartesian diagram you know a horizontal axis vertical axis but that position which is one of an infinite number of places of points that the body may be uh, taking in that space it's actually a strict outcome of two very independent things, the x-axis uh, projection and the y-axis projection. Those two things combined, they're completely independent because they're orthogonal, and those two things combined will give you the specific, in fact, position of the point. Similarly, for the Stoics, everything that you influence is the result that can be, can be in turn broken down into these two components, the, the part that is up to you and the part that's not up to you. To use the example that I just gave, my health can certainly be influenced by me. And I should do things to take care of my health. There's no question about it. But the outcome is the result of 
the, the, these two components, the part that is up to me, going to the doctor, going to the gym, eat healthy and so on and so forth, and the part that is not up to me, the random virus coming from the other side of the world and striking me, or, or simply the car that hits me if I cross the street at the wrong moment and then I end up in the hospital, that sort of stuff, right? So it, it sounds counterintuitive, but it, it turns out that this can be this, this, this dichotomy, this, uh, uh, this fork can be defended. Now, why the hell would we want to talk about this? Well, the reason is because it has very practical applications. And the practical application is the following. This, this is essentially, the Stoics are telling you that what you should do is to focus your attention on the stuff that is up to you because that's where your agency is maximized. Right, so focus on your efforts, on your attempt, you know, on going to the gym, on, on eating healthy, on doing all of those things that I fed up to you, because that's where your agency actually is maximized. And then develop work to develop a attitude of equanimity toward the outcomes, the stuff that is not up to you. Why? Well, because that's life. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Uh, sometimes things will go your way, sometimes they don't. Sometimes you don't get sick, sometimes you do get sick. And uh, it's, not, it, it's not your fault if things don't go your way, so long as you're focused on the stuff that was up to you and you've done the, whatever was proper to do. All right, we, um, we are now uh, just about in an hour. Um, shall, I, shall I take one more, one more question, Massimo? Sure, let's go for one more and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, so I'm gonna actually go to Martha. Um, so I'm unmuting Martha now. Um, Martha, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, this is a historical uh, question. Uh, at the time, astrology was very uh, woven into life. Um, is there anything from, in the writings, the sources related to their opinion, attitude towards or, or involvement with astrology, uh, either school? Oh, that's an interesting question. I can tell you about the, the Stoics because uh, Marcus Aurelius explicitly mentions astrology and, um, uh, 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 and the ability to predict the future and things like that. And he dismisses that as what we would today call pseudoscience. So he says, don't, 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 don't pay attention to that. That said, the Stoics, however, they were big on, um, uh, on predicting the future by way of looking at signs uh, you know, in, in things that were happening. And to that, to, to us contemporaries, that sounds also as pseudoscience. It's like, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but for them, it was, it, if you think about it, it made logical sense because they, as I said, they were determinists. They believed in cause and universal cause and effect. And so it stood to reason to them that if everything is connected to everything else, then you ought to be able to pick a particular aspect of the universal web of cause and effect, and from there extrapolate back into the past or, 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 or into the future or forward into the future and figure out what's, what, what was going to happen, right? Um, so that, that's, uh, they did believe in that, although one of the Stoics, uh, the middle Stoics, Posidonius, actually rejected this notion. Uh, but this was embedded into their notion of cause and effect. In a, in a sense, it is very different from what we do today in science, when we want to predict the future, what do we do? We look at the pertinent uh, aspect of the pertinent, pertinent portion of the web of cause and effect, and we try to make predictions, extrapolations, right? Uh, the only difference between us and the Stoics is that we are much more discerning about which part of the, of the web of cause and effect we actually look at uh, if we want to make predictions. Thank Aaron, you. do you have anything to add on? Uh... Yes, there, there are very specific sources um, in Epicurean philosophy to look at. Um, if you look up, if you Google the principal doctrines, Epicur Epicurus principal doctrines, read principal doctrines 10 through 13, where Epicurus talks about the importance of studying nature, um, and uh, he sees science and the study of nature as a way to save us from superstition and from degrading um, ourselves due to fear, superstition, fear, fears, and things like that. Um, there's also the letter to Pythocles, if you are interested in the ancient conversations concerning astronomy, um, where the, the first efforts to really understand scientifically and more or less empirically with whatever tools they had, which, which were very limited. Um, Letter to Pythocles is uh, Epicurus um, teaching one of his disciples um, a, a summary of all everything that they believed about the doctrine of innumerable worlds and the you know, things that we can um, understand about astronomy and about the cosmos. 
Um, so um, they, uh, Epicurus was one of the first people that was like together with Democritus and the atomist lineage um, to come up with a scientific cosmology that was a purely naturalistic. Um, there's also a reference in the letter to Menecius, I think towards the end, and a few of, of the other sayings uh, towards the end where um, Epicurus invites his disciples to laugh with scorn at fate, which other men take for a goddess, destined the goddess of fate or whatever. So, so there's sources in Epicurean philosophy that address that, yeah. This is great. Thank you so much to both of you. Let me just remind everyone in the audience um, about the, the upcoming episodes again. Um, we've got the, um, the episode uh, featuring uh, ethical culture and secular humanism with Anne Cleason on May 24th at 5 p.m. Eastern. That's a Sunday. And then we have the, dial we have the episode with, on, on focusing on Confucianism and Taoism. Um, and that's June 6th, which is a Saturday, also at 5 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, everyone, for your participation and for coming. Thank you, Massimo and Hiram. And Massimo, I'm going to have to leave it to you to end it because I have no idea how. <laughs> yes, the technology. You leave the technology part to me. Um, but I wanted to again thank thank you for hosting this. Thank Iron for coming on. Um, Sky for lurking in the background. Our third co-editor, and uh, and everybody who has come. Uh, this, this was this was fun and I hope uh, informative. And uh, we'll see you for the next uh, two episodes. <laughs>